Hello, Barry. For the first time ever, I've been sleeping on my dreams this week. <laughs> Chad, I've loved seeing this turnaround in your opinion on the king himself who released another album, Mr. Jacob Collier. Yes. And I, I got this amazing message from Chad saying he started listening to the album and I think it was the first two or three tracks. He's like, Barry, I'll be honest. It's just, he's not doing it for me. And I looked at the message and my heart sank a little bit. I was like, damn it. Have I become so much of a fanboy that I'm now overestimating the quality of his stuff? <laughs> and uh, for a while, I was trying to think of what my response was going to be. And then, Chad, what happened a couple songs later? Well, basically, I got into track number four, which is a, a banger. Track number five, which is equally banging. And then I got to Sleeping on My Dreams. And I actually got off my seat and started jamming because, <laughs> man, oh, man, that is such a song. It, whatever you're doing... Right after this podcast, open up Jacob Collier's Sleeping on My Dreams and just just do it. Just do it. It will make your day. It will make your week. Man, what a song. I got the most amazing video from Chad with like this little like pan from the, from the <laughs> computer where he was playing the song to his face. And I just saw absolute childlike joy on that man's <laughs> face. It was such a wonderful video to see. And uh, of course, Jacob Collier pulls it out, you know. Absolutely. And I even took that video. I hadn't even gone into the shower yet. I just rolled out of bed and there was no, <laughs> no, no worries. I was like, let me just do this. Like you say, childlike. It was such a great song. Anyway, I'm rambling. Welcome to Across the Pond. Pond, across the pond with Barry and Chad. So Barry, how has your week been that side? I know there's been quite a bit of news which we're going to get into but loads of funny memes on the back of that i sent you one earlier today man oh man yeah the week has been good chad i'm in a very good mood things seem to be looking up fingers crossed um but here this side of the pond we are we are happy we are excited we are dancing in the streets sort of and <laughs> uh, we'll chat about that a bit later but the week has been really good how are you doing chad yeah no all good this side as well had a fairly chilled out weekend um we got some much needed rain i know we don't want to speak about weather barry but uh, the rain is certainly <laughs> appreciated very very grateful for that because we were just did it cool you down week. a bit at least it did yeah now it's it's back to reasonable temperatures here in london so, so this is this is a good thing but the rest of the world is heating up let's chat about it the week that was Barry, like I said, the rest of the world is heating up. Some crazy news coming out of Russia. There's a COVID-19 vaccine that has been granted regulatory approval in Russia. And uh, yeah, I mean, this is essentially the first vaccine that has actually been given the, the green light by any, I don't know, you know, regulatory body around the world. And it's been dubbed Sputnik V. And uh, yeah, I mean, surprisingly, it only had two months of testing. Chad, is there any story that comes out of Russia that isn't crazy at this stage? <laughs> like, we never get stories that come out that are like, okay, we expected that. Okay, yeah. that makes sense. That kind of is reasonable. Everything is always a, a bit of a crazy story. So like you say, very, very short testing process. Um, we don't know what kind of rigor was in that testing process, yeah. but that vaccine is now out there and, and being administered to patients in Russia. So that's a very interesting state of affairs. I saw a very sarcastic but also honest tweet about it saying that, I don't, I don't want to condone that vaccine stuff, but I'm glad that they are testing it over there and they can let us know how it goes. <laughs> so a very, very honest statement about hopefully if they get some success, maybe it points to something that's real or maybe it points us in a different direction. Who knows? Yeah, well, there's a lot of things to unpack there, Barry. There's a lot uh, that I've read about in this in this particular article, which says that the company who's going to be actually manufacturing this for mass production is only, only going to be able to produce one and a half million of these per year. So I think in terms of sharing this with the rest of the world, it doesn't seem like that's part of the intention here. I mean, Russia's never been that good at sharing, if we're honest with ourselves. So it kind of makes yeah. sense. But it is a strange one. I mean, one and a half million. I mean, I don't know. What is the population of Russia? I'm sure it's a lot more than that. So like, it's interesting yeah. to see how they're going to implement that, where they're going to get it. I know the logistics in Russia are very difficult because the cities are so far apart. Like Russia is this giant landmass and the cities are dotted all around the place. And so if you're going from, say, St. Petersburg all the way to Moscow, you're going to be traveling a long journey. So the logistics of distributing these one and a half million vaccines is going to be a challenge. Something. Yeah, yeah, certainly. And just in terms of that strategy, it'll definitely be interesting to see what that is. But from what I've seen, it looks like from as early as next week, the frontline workers are going to be, you know, forced to take this vaccine, which certainly, certainly is interesting. And how would you feel if that was you? 
Oh, I don't know, Chad. I don't know. It, it, it really comes down to how much do you trust the person that's giving you the yeah. vaccine, right? A, a lot of the Bill Gates conspiracy theories have been about this. Been about, oh, no, Bill Gates is going to force you to take his vaccine, and if you can't trust him, then, then things could go wrong. And so I'm sure it's the same in Russia. I mean, if I'm a Russian citizen right now who's kind of objective about what's going on, I'll be a little bit... A little bit cautious, yeah. um, but at the same time, it's too early to tell, right? Maybe this is the thing. Maybe this is the panacea, and we'll have to wait and see. Um, but it certainly is strange that after so little testing, they're willing to just give it to their frontline workers. Yeah, really, really fascinating. And uh, yeah, we'll have to see whether it is the one or not. Just in terms of you know where it's actually come from, it's come from a lab that a lot of people didn't even really know about. Um, a lot of people were surprised about Russia you know, being the first to actually come through with this medical breakthrough, if it is that. Um, because, you know, on the medical field, I, I certainly would, you know, initially think that the US, the UK, et cetera, et cetera, are, are you know, miles ahead in terms of that space. Um, but I believe this is a center that's been ticking away for years. There's been this kind of technology um, that's been able to develop these types of vaccines at, at fairly quick pace. And I believe one of the successful ones that they've had in the past was a Ebola vaccine that apparently did very well. Yeah, I think that obviously we're talking about tongue in cheek about Russia, but we mustn't underestimate yeah. their power when it comes to science and technology, right? If you think about the impact that Russia has had on science and uh, mathematics and specifically throughout history, it really is significant. I mean, if you think about the fact that they were fighting the US to send rockets to the moon, right? Yeah. And they're a big part in that space race. So there's a, a big culture there of technology and science and whatnot. So it makes sense that Russia would be in that conversation. Of course, we don't often think about them like that, like you say. We would have assumed to come from the yeah. UK or the US, etc. Um, but Russia is really up there when it comes to science and so it remains to be seen what's going to happen for me I'm excited about it just from a kind of observing perspective yep. because hopefully this means that the other vaccines are close or are getting there along the line um, and if that's the case then we can really accelerate this return to normal and get the world's economy back churning like it should yeah definitely well let's talk a little bit about that return to normal because on this side I'm walking the streets and I'm seeing more and more people and I'm seeing less people fussed about being in personal bubbles. I think right in the beginning, we were all thrown out into the wilderness and very, very, very cautious. And I think a lot of people are feeling a lot more comfortable now to the point where people are you know, starting to travel. Me, myself as well, starting to travel from, from next week, actually. And I think next week's episode, we're going to be broadcasting from Greece as well. So very excited about that. Uh, but nevertheless, how are you feeling on that side, Barry? Has the sentiment shifted there slightly? It has, Chad, because as of, as of when we were recording this, last, last night, I think it was, I think it was last <laughs> night, good old Uncle Cyril came and had a, a family meeting with everybody. And so everyone sat down in front of their TVs at 8 p.m. And he gave his, his famous opening statement, my fellow South Africans, and then went into this long ramble that, that Cyril likes to do. And basically what happened was South Africa has been moved down a, a level of lockdown. So it moved down to level two. Now, again, it, that doesn't mean anything unless yeah. you know what's changed, right? So the, the key things that have changed, I think, for a lot of South Africans is that alcohol is back, Chad. <laughs> alcohol <laughs> is back. And so you, you, you referenced it at the beginning. The memes that have come out in the last week about booze being back have been <laughs> gold. Oh, my gosh. Tell me about it. Um, yeah, just that first gathering where you can actually, well, now you're allowed to visit family and friends, I believe. Uh, you're allowed to actually go into, you know, friends and family's homes and you're allowed to bring alcohol as well. So I think a lot of people are very, very pleased about that. Um, but I mean, just in terms of the general sentiment, Barry, I know you were out uh, having a game of golf. What was it like? What was it like being out breathing in some fresh air, being able to be with friends again? It was really good, Chad. Like, I, I really, when I was up, play, up playing and seeing friends I hadn't seen in a long time, it just kind of reminded me how much I'd missed social yep. connection. And I really had a good time, like being out in the sun, getting some fresh air, like you say, and being with friends was awesome. I think the sentiment is is a little bit mixed at the moment. It, it is very jubilant in the sense that you can now go and visit friends and family. Yep. Restaurants can now serve alcohol. Cigarettes are back, et cetera, et cetera. Interprovincial travel is back. So some of these restrictions that have been holding people back have, have been lifted now. But at the, at the other side, there's a lot of people still calling for caution, right? Because our case numbers have been have been okay in the last yep. couple couple weeks and, and certainly have been managed. But again, we don't want to have another second wave. And we're still going through a cold front this side, so we're not out of the woods when it comes to winter just yet. And so I'd say it's a bit mixed. I'd say there's a little bit, there's a lot of excitement, yeah. of course, but hopefully a little bit of caution as well. We don't want to take silly risks in the next few weeks and just blow everything out of proportion. It's about like being careful, being, being clever about what you do yeah. and slowly trying to move back to normal. 100%. And I hope that kind of sensibility 
follows. I think right in the beginning, it's always very, very easy to, you know, just go back to old habits again. And um, I think if we do adopt that slightly more cautious approach, uh, it'll certainly, certainly be for the best uh, in the long run. So yeah, let's hope that does happen. Certainly the side, I know, you know, like I said, the activity is definitely starting to pick up. Obviously, we mentioned the eat out to help out scheme, which Barry, I failed to mention when we spoke about it is only from Monday to Wednesday. So Monday to Wednesday, oh. the queues are crazy. There's queues of people piling up and, <laughs> you know, the social distances there are not great in those queues. Um, but yeah, let's just hope, um, I, I guess, we've got the right balance between economy and, uh, you know, health of the general population as well. So we'll, we'll definitely see how that how that one works. Now, Barry, a topic that we were both fairly passionate about when we spoke about it the last time, and we were talking about paywalls, and we are talking about how paywalls have basically just been built up around the world, um, especially in the US, in the UK, the kind of major news agencies around the world. I know we were talking quite specifically about Financial Times as well. And on your side of the pond in South Africa, I heard this past week that News24, the good old News24, has decided it's time to do the same thing, uh, just in terms of general profitability um, they've kind of switched to their loyal subscribers and readers and ultimately made a bit of a plea there yeah, it's a very controversial move, Chad, and it really has kind of caused ripples throughout social media. Uh, for those who don't know, News24 was a very big deal here in South Africa. It's kind of seen as a very key media source. Um, and, I, and I don't know why, to be honest, because I think you know, Chad, the journalism is not great yeah. there. Um, they've made some shockers in the past. They've made some really <laughs> poor errors in the past. Sometimes you read an article of theirs and you're like, did an editor actually look at this? Yeah. Did they actually see this before it went out? Um, so it doesn't have the gravitas that, say, a New York times does or financial times does it's, it's yeah. very much a it feels like a breaking news type organization which doesn't care as much about facts or about like mm -hmm. nuance and rather just wants to throw headlines at you and so when they came out with this thing and they, they wanted 75 rand a month for their subscribers right. to get access to everything behind the paywall and uh, i think that i think they're going to be in trouble to be honest because I don't see myself paying a cent for their journalism because, like I say, I don't think they have the credibility in my eyes. In my opinion, it's one of those things where I think they've the reason they've done so well is because of the branding. Like News yep. Twenty Four is a great brand, and when you search in Google, it just it, it's the perfect SEO, right? And so often when you search for something, that'll be the first uh, media outlet that comes up. And so I feel like they've been successful because of their brand more so than their journalism itself. Right. I don't know if that rings true for you in, in your experience, Chad. Yeah, I do. I do somewhat agree. Um, but I was listening to a very very interesting discussion really with the CEO who was talking about the strategy, talking about you know what makes News Twenty Four. News 24. And he's talking about essentially this idea that news is not free. Ultimately, um, breaking news organizations, he said it's easy to be one of those, which I found very interesting because that's pretty much what you just called them. Um, and, you know, he's, yeah. he was basically differentiating them in, in the fact of, you know, they are sending out journalists onto the ground to go and get the, you know, the first scoop. He, he kind of mentioned a couple of groundbreaking reports um, in terms of state capture and corruption and that kind of stuff and, and actually hinted that there was one in the works. So I'm definitely keen to hear more about that, although... If either of us don't have that subscription, I'm not sure we will. Um, but anyway, <laughs> I, I did find it really quite a fascinating discussion uh, ultimately about how a CEO positions um, his offering and, and ultimately also looks at all the various sub offerings within it. So talking about the sports journalism, talking about the you know gossip and celebrity side of things as well. Um, it, it just was a really interesting discussion. Yeah, I think they kind of run across the gamut. And so it's very interesting to see the various journalism journalisms the various journalists talking about their individual areas like you say so i saw a few of the sports commentators and some of the yep. political commentators on their twitters talking about this and talking about how we have to change the way that information is valued and i really agree with that principle i think that we have got very used to getting this stuff for free and and we chatted about the the bad the the, the terrible impacts of the advertising based model and what it's done yep. for clickbait and what it's done for um, democracy and all these sorts of things so i agree with that principle that information should be valued but it's very hard for one organization to go out on their own and make that kind of claim, right? So I understand News24 is a, is a leader in the space and so they've got a lot of clout and so when it comes from the CEO's mouth, it makes it makes a big difference and makes a ripple. But you almost need the whole industry to buy into this yep. together so that they can kind of work as a team in a way. Because Definitely. in my opinion, when I see this move, 
in my own life, I just see myself going to different sources immediately yep. because I, I don't have that connection to News 24. I don't go to them on purpose in a way. I don't, I don't look for their journalism. Yep. It's, just, it's just branded so well and it's so popular. Um, there's certain journalists that I like, but then I'll just follow them on Twitter and kind of get their, their voices through there. So I think it's going to be an interesting test study, especially here in South Africa, to see if it's successful. Because maybe I'm wrong. Maybe they've got that 5 10% of their market that really values this stuff and is willing to pay that 75 rand to actually make this a, a profitable business. And if they can do that, then then I'll eat my words and we'll come back a few episodes in a time and we'll talk about it again. Yeah. But for the moment, I'm a bit skeptical as to whether it's going to work, even though I respect the messaging. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, all very, very valid concerns. And I guess we'll see what happens to that subscriber base. I guess the thing is some people might be enticed at the beginning to you know go in pay that 75 rand but if they can't switch their offering to premium type you know subscription offering right away from the moment people hit subscribe and you know put in their credit card details i think it is going to be hard to get people to stay around stick around um, and, and keep paying those ongoing subscriptions one of the pieces of that discussion that i wanted to pick your brain on barry was when the ceo was basically talking about facebook and ultimately how facebook's advertising is unrivaled um, which i found really to be quite refreshing if i'm honest to hear ceo come on and open out there, admit that one of the big revenue drivers uh, in media, in all types of media, is advertising. And ultimately, you know, giving credit to to Facebook where it's due. Um, basically talking about how, you know, a lot of News 24's traffic is shared around Facebook. A lot of people share their articles, all of that kind of stuff. And he was basically saying that he does not want Facebook to be the beneficiary of their content any longer. Yeah, I think it's interesting. I mean, we, we chat a lot about Facebook on this show and a lot of it's been negative, but you're actually yeah. right. It's like they have the reason they are so profitable, the reason they are such a ginormous business is because they opened up all these new opportunities for all sorts of media platforms, small and medium businesses, large corporations to advertise in a way like never before. Right. The reason that Facebook works so well is that ultra specific targeting, that amazing statistics, that amazing kind of measurement behind the scenes yep. that allows your advertising really to get bang for its buck rather than trying to buy new paper ads and billboards and TV ads and all that stuff of yesteryear. So it, it, it's interesting to hear him talking about that. Of course, that comes with a price, yeah. right? And so you're paying revenue, that commission, like he says, and, and it all lives on Facebook a lot of the time. Like I'm sure News24 would like to get those 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 readers off of Facebook and onto their own site, exactly. right? So that they, they can kind of keep them in the ecosystem. Yeah. And if people are just reading things on Facebook, like we've chatted about in the past, and then just scrolling onto the next thing, then there isn't that connection to that News24 brand. And that's that whole it's that whole debate at the moment is about what do you own on, on the web, right? So you, obviously you own your domain, you own your homepage, and you're trying to siphon users from these social media distribution channels onto that homepage. But the balance of power lies with those distribution channels because they control the eyeballs, right? They exactly. control the attention. Yep. And so how do you have a fair balance between the two? Because you need Facebook. News 24, like you say, relies on Facebook. They can't just shut that down and say, cool, we're not dealing with them anymore. Exactly. But at the same time, you've got to try and fight to control your own brand and your own audience. And that's what the subscription model might be, now that I think about it. Yep. It's trying yep. to get those super fans, those people who really appreciate that journalism, and get them into one place so that they can and then serve them better. So taking some of that subscription revenue, hopefully hiring some good editors, hiring some good <laughs> journalists, and really delivering a premium product, like you say, to the absolute super fans that then become your ambassadors going forward. Absolutely. I think that is the strategy, but we'll have to definitely see whether, whether it actually pays off. And I mean, just in terms of actually just hearing about, you know, the actual tools that Facebook give advertisers. And I think that's the other thing is the lack of, of appetite from advertisers to go to a news agency and place an advert directly on their website or, you know, on their on their blogs or whatever the case is the idea here is that on facebook you can go in and directly target your advertising to a specific audience a specific band of age ranges genders you know interests all of those kinds of things which ultimately you know make return on investment a lot higher for any advertiser Without a doubt, if I'm sitting with a marketing budget right now, I'm spending 95% of my money on the, that sort of advertising yeah. because it, it's just better. It's better in every single way. It's more cost effective. It's better tracked. You've got better stats. You've got much better targeting. Um, it really is a no-brainer. And that's what people talk about when Facebook's got this monopoly. Like if you're reasonable yeah. and you're rational, you're giving all your money to Facebook because that's the right place to go. Um, and so we need to see more innovation in the space. And so maybe the subscription model is, is one that might work for them. But like you say, it's it's 
the, the Facebook stuff is so much better than, than the competition. It's so much yeah. better than any other type of advertising. And so how do you get away from the monster when like that's that's the horse that feeds you? Yeah, really, really hard. And uh, I just hope I hope it works out for them because uh, we don't want to see any more companies going bust, especially at this time where so many are already. Barry, shall we move on? Let's do it, Chad. Stuff I found interesting. Ooh, I was pretty excited to chat about this one because last night <laughs> for the very first time you might not believe me barry i know this movie's been out for i don't know a couple of years when was it released do you remember yeah a couple of years ago i'm not <laughs> sure exactly yet but certainly more than enough time for you to have watched it yeah Chad. well like always i'm, I'm late <laughs> to the game um but I, I watched ready player one and the best thing is it was included in my amazon prime subscription which we always like we don't like paying extra money for for content amazing um, where you actually get value from the various subscriptions you have on an ongoing basis <laughs> and man oh man was this movie incredible or what i was absolutely blown away i've watched the trailer i think five to ten times before in deciding whether to watch it whether it was renting it actually going to see it at the movie cinema and very very often a trailer will get you a little bit there but ultimately, I can't tell you too much, right? It needs to whet your appetite, really just get that interest there, but but not give too much away in the story. And ultimately, that trailer just didn't bait me. I don't know why, but it just didn't. Somehow, <laughs> last night it did and, you know, ended up watching it. And it was one of those where for the first time in a very long time, Barry, I was absolutely on the edge of my seat. We had some food deliveries coming through and like as soon as I got the delivery, as soon as it was settled down on my lap, I couldn't wait to get back to the film. And uh, yeah, I mean, I thoroughly, <laughs> thoroughly enjoyed it. And did you not know anything about the story beforehand? Like was, was the trailer your first interaction with, with Ready Player One? Yeah, so the trailer was basically the first uh, interaction. I mean, from the trailer, very, very okay. clear to see it's based in a virtual reality environment. For those who haven't seen it, maybe we should, uh, I don't know, just discuss the plot a bit. I guess it's it's been released so long ago that at this point, you can't tell us we're giving you any spoilers. Um, it's it's been out, it's been out, right? So, uh, so let's let's discuss it. Ultimately, I think it's set in year twenty forty five, somewhere around there. And uh, I mean, somewhere basically, there, yeah. it's it's world as it as it will be at that point in time. We've got this caravan park that uh, you know ultimately people are really living on top of each other, and you've got drones to you know kind of get your food deliveries and all of that kind of stuff. And ultimately, the world as it is in reality, is is not a great place, right? Uh, basically, you know, your environment is, is just, there's litter everywhere. It's it's not a great place. And so a lot of people are escaping that because there's this tool, this game, um, ultimately this world called the Oasis that you can escape to using a virtual reality headset. And uh, ultimately you follow the story of, uh, of this game and the world that it is. And it really is like hyper-realistic. You've got these suits that you can put on and your character can actually feel things so if somebody touches you you'll literally feel it on the suit that you're wearing in your real life body and then it basically takes a little bit of a turn where the creator of this game has passed away and uh, in his legacy he leaves this magic easter egg within the game for somebody who's noble who's willing who's able to actually find it um, and ultimately with that easter egg get full ownership of the game now for you to grasp this you need to understand that pretty much every single person in the world is logged on to this game and playing. So the following here is huge. There's some real money implications. People buy gear within the game because ultimately this is where they're living, right? They're living in this virtual world. And so if you find that egg and you get ownership of this game, you essentially become like a trillionaire. And so for me, this plot just had so much to offer because not only were you looking for an Easter egg in a game, but there was a real world implication there. Had you won it, you would literally have been able to get real money. And so the various bits of the plot, which we'll, we'll unpick, Barry, but just a great premise for a highly entertaining movie. Chad, it makes me so happy to hear you so passionate <laughs> about this story. It's so super cool. Um, it's been one of my favorite stories for my whole life. Wow. It's probably one of my top five sci-fi stories. And um, I, mean, I feel like a bit of a book snob here, but it was based <laughs> off a novel in the 1980s, right? Ooh, wow. And it's a very famous sci-fi novel that was written in the 1980s. And it's, the reason it's famous is because 
its predictive power about what virtual reality was going to be in today's world was unparalleled. It was the very first piece of modern science fiction that kind of predicted what a virtual reality world could look like. And of okay. course, it was like this dystopian view of everyone's going to be like fat and sitting eating fast food in their cubicles and plugging into this <laughs> virtual world but not being like realistic in the real yep. world. And they called this decades ago, Chad, way before Oculus Rift, way before any of the, the VR that we see today. And so I think that's what makes the story so amazing is that it was written in the 1980s. And I think you can see that if you watch the movie and you read the book, there's a lot of pop um, popular culture right. references from the 1980s yep. all over the yep. movie. Yep. When it comes to the music, when it comes to the, the imagery, when it comes to the posters, everything is the 80s because that's when it was written. And so at okay. the time, it was like a cult classic in a way because it was looking forward to what will the technology look like in, like you say, 2040 or 2050, whatever the, whatever the year was. Um, and, and like you say, it's it's a story that is so gripping and so compelling that it it's, it's really is an amazing read. And and so I, I read it back, I read it a little while ago and like it became one of my, my firm favorites. I loved the movie. I was very yeah. nervous going to see the movie <laughs> as with anything where you really love the book. You're like, oh, are they going to do it justice? Yeah. Um, but they really did. I mean, for me, the graphics and oh. the CGI and just the cinematography was unbelievable. Oh, they it. really shot it out of the park like that. And it was a, a treat for the eyes, Chad. Oh, it absolutely was. Um, you know, nothing else can describe it but this kind of this kind of sound. <laughs> um, it really, really was incredible. Um, I, I actually I couldn't believe the graphics. I couldn't believe that scale. And it's a, it's a Steven Spielberg production as well. Um, so I didn't quite realize that it was written in 1980s, but you're right. Uh, there were a lot of references to Duran Duran, um, all, the, all the kind of music oh, yeah. from back then, uh, kind of the old school video games as well. Um, basically, mm -hmm. arcades. Yeah, basically one of the last challenges. Um, so yeah, I mean, I'm really pleased to hear that the, that the book adequately matches the, the movie because like you say, a lot of the time that doesn't happen and uh, people can find themselves quite disappointed uh, when, when that is the case. So Barry, what is your favorite scene from the film? Oh, dude, I, I, I don't know. That's a tough question, of course. <laughs> I, I think the, mo the, moment, the moment that he first realizes there's an Easter egg, yep. I think that, is, that for me is, the, is, the, is that, that pinnacle of that story because it's all leading up to that moment, yep. to that moment where he realizes that there's this mission to go on, that there's this journey to go on. Yep. It kind of reminds me a little bit of The Da Vinci Code by Dan Brown, like a similar sort of moment okay. when he realizes that there's all this hidden stuff behind what seems to be face yep. value. And when he realizes that there are just levels to this game, like literally and figuratively, yep that there are levels behind this that can be discovered. I think that's that for me is, is, is my favorite part because that is the start of that discovery. And I, I'm a sucker for those kind of stories, Chad. I'm a, I'm a sucker for those kind of long, drawn-out, mission-based stories yeah. where this guy's got to figure it all out. Whether it's Charlie in the Chocolate Factory and he's trying to win the, the Tro Chocolate Factory, whether it's Lord of the Rings where they're trying to get that ring into that volcano, whatever it is, <laughs> those long hero's journeys for me is, is, is my favorite. How about you? Yeah, I have to agree. So it was actually actually at a similar moment but for me the most kind of euphoric moment that I felt and I really really was in awe when this moment happened um, was when he figured out that for the very first key all he needed to do was drive backwards because you see him you see him trudging <laughs> along above the ground so basically to set the scene for anyone listening who hasn't seen it ultimately it's a race right it's a car race and you've got these crazy players these people who um so i mean based on the premise of this film as well one thing i didn't touch on is you die as well right oh yeah so you don't just respawn as another body. Uh, you basically level up your avatar. And if you die, well, that's you. You've got to start right from the beginning. Um, so that definitely is a, is a fascinating change on, you know, video game type world and makes it a lot more realistic and a lot more lifelike. So you see him trudging along, trying to get his way to the end. You've got King Kong, um, you know, bashing his way around the city, knocking through all of these races. And ultimately, King Kong goes and hides behind this ramp. And anyone who kind of actually goes past it to the finish line, it looks like it's fairly easy. It looks like you can just go straight to the finish line. Ultimately, King Kong will catch you and you will die. Um, but as soon as you see him go backwards, there's this other hidden world, like you say, Barry. Ultimately, it was just a riddle and it needed to be figured out. And this whole hidden world, and you see how easy it was for him to get to the finish line. You still see the madness above unfolding. You still see King Kong, but he's in this other section that King Kong can't get to. Um, and for me, I just, I don't know, I was, it was such a euphoric moment for me. I, I loved it. And I kind of wonder whether in, you know, in real life too, sometimes there are some, you know, easy 
ways out there and we, for some reason, go for the harder options. Don't you agree? Definitely, Chad. And that's exactly the point the, the writer is trying to make, right? Or the screenwriter is trying mm. to make is that so often in life, we are we just follow what everyone else is doing because we assume they know what's going on. We assume that they know the best route. We assume that, that whatever path is in front of them, we should follow because it, it doesn't make sense to go any other way. And what this movie tries to show you is that if you just step away from for a moment and you like think a bit out of the box, you think a bit differently to everybody else, and you take a different path, the less trodden path, yeah. sometimes it becomes an absolute like shortcut, right? And you end up like like sidestepping all the nonsense that the herd is going for. Yep. And that's what a lot of this movie is it's about this guy who does the opposite to what other people do. We, he travels the path alone compared to where the herd is going. And it really is a psychological allegory as well of, of the way that he thinks and, and the kind of the maverick that he is. And that's why he deserves to find the secret, yeah. the secret thing at the end, right? right? Because that's the kind of person that he is. And so for all of us, like if you look at our own lives, there's so much that we struggle with that we kind of just, we do the same thing every single time expecting something else to yeah. change. We, we go down the same path, we hit the same obstacles, and we just keep hitting the same wall. Instead of like stepping back and thinking, hold on a minute, is there another way to do this? Yeah. Is there a simpler way to do this? Is there a, a less complicated way to try? And often if we just take that moment to think about it <laughs> and then try something a little bit different, even if it seems silly yeah. at the time, but you do something different, different results come out and you can learn from that to move forward. So that's what I love about the story, that there's so much philosophy and psychology behind just the cool tech itself absolutely it's a story that honestly does have everything because it's got all of what we just discussed on the back of that it's got the villain it's got the love you've got this this love affair that happens as well which is really enjoyable to watch as well i, I thoroughly thoroughly enjoyed it where you know he meets this player in this virtual reality world falls in love with her her character and ultimately in in reality her character could be an old man sitting on a couch who's grossly overweight. Um, because this is, it's a game ultimately, right? You pick your avatar. You can be anything you want to be. Um, and so when in reality it turns out she is actually a, a beautiful girl and, uh, you know, they actually in real life get hit it on as well. Um, it just is such a rewarding uh, kind of bit of you know screen share and uh, yeah i just definitely loved all of that what was your take on on the villain situation as well ioi industries um ultimately you know trying to basically win this easter egg and uh, I, I guess reap the financial rewards yeah I, I think it was great i think it's very indicative of the kind of sci-fi that was being written at the time it's it's very very similar to the kind of the villain idea in 1984 by george orwell right. and some of those books at that time and um, this this kind of very asynchronous kind of big corporation or yep. big organization that's trying to, like you say, to just win and take all and kind of grab whatever they can. Um, and it's again, it's this David Ruth Goliath story, right? It's this one dude who's kind of do it, <laughs> kind of do it all on its own for the most part versus this giant villain that seems insurmountable. Um, and it's a classic story of, 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 of that, of that David Ruth Goliath. And so I loved it. I really did. I think that the, the amount of power that those stories have to remind mm. us uh, that there's so much more to this world and to this life and to this virtual reality than we realize and that these big corporations might not have the right incentives and might not have the right motives, but they're not destined to win if we do the right thing. Absolutely. And even though we've come across all of these stories, you know, time and time again, somehow they just never get old. It's like a four chord song. It's like, you know, the, the four chord pop song. <laughs> it never gets old. It's, exactly. it's suddenly, you know, nuanced or, or a little bit different spin on it. Um, in this version of uh, virtual reality or whatever the case is, slightly different changes in the storyline. Um, but ultimately, it's the same recipe, rinse, repeat, and uh, it's it's just so enjoyable. Why do those stories work over and over again? It's burdened into our psychology, Chad. It's like a human thing. Like the kind of stories we used to tell around the fireplace right. when we were cavemen like 10,000 years ago had the exact same structure and I promise you you can look at any really popular story ever made okay. and it has the exact same structure it has the exact same rise and fall of, of the hero's journey that they call it if you listen to Jordan Peterson sp speak about it he speaks about it with a lot of passion talking about how this kind of mythical hero's journey is what is the human's like 
point of being in this world. If you think about our own lives, we see ourselves as some sort of hero's journey in a weird yep. sort of way. We, we, kind of, we kind of imagine ourselves as the lead actor in our movie, in our story. And as we live our life, a lot of us are, are dreaming of that hero's journey. We want to become that person yep. who get over those obstacles and kind of win the girl or win the, win the competition <laughs> or, or beat the game, whatever the story is. And so that story structure is storytelling 101. It is, it is burned into absolutely everything. And like you say, even though we know this, theoretically, we know that these stories are all the same when it comes down to the bare bones of it. They are still so compelling. It really doesn't matter what kind of skin you put on top of it. It is compelling, it is emotional, and it leaves you feeling this this, this euphoria like you've been saying. It's one of those weird things about humans. Like this, These kinds of stories just get us, get us going. Get us going indeed. Barry, I want to tell you something really, really cool. Yes. And that is that one of the scenes shot in the movie was actually shot, and I, I must go back and look at you know when it was actually filmed versus when I was actually there, but it was actually filmed right across the road, and you could actually see the building that I used to work in um, when I first arrived no in London. That is crazy, Chad. <laughs> Jeez, like... So, 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 so across from where you worked, you say? So you looked out yeah. on the street? Yeah, so basically IOI Industries, that building that uh, ultimately you see the girl run out <laughs> when she you know, gets her breakthrough. Running down the street, you've got all those little Renault Twingos on the side. Um, I think they're Twingos. They might actually not be. Um, but those really small Renaults, you, you get them in the UK, you don't really get them in South Africa. Um, but yeah, basically as she runs down that street, the building to the right, uh, which is 25 Rope Maker Street, was the one that I actually worked in. Um, and so opposite the road is IOI Industries. And it's it's basically a, a you know an office block um, that, that has, I think, a few law firms in there as well. Um, really, really cool. Okay. That is super cool, Chad. And if they were filming when you were there and you didn't know about Ready Player One, yep. Uh, I'm never going to let you live it, live it down. Well, I'll have to check out the facts and let you know. But I hope not either, because that would that would be game over, really. <laughs> <laughs> Please read the book, Chad. Please read the book. I will Please. have to add it to my list. I'm currently working my way through a book written by Malcolm Gladwell, Barry, called Talking to Strangers. And uh, once I get through that, I hope we can definitely have a discussion over here. Definitely. Gladwell is a champion, so I'm looking forward to that. Let's look ahead. Looking ahead. Looking ahead, Barry, this is the part of the podcast where we start to talk. We have basically have full permission to let go on our favorite topic of all, and that is technology. This week, I saw a, basically it's a rumor, right? So do keep that at the back of your mind. But a rumor that Apple <laughs> are thinking about rolling up something called Apple One, which is essentially going to be the mega subscription of mega subscriptions. So at the moment, obviously, you've got Apple Music. You've got Apple TV, you've got Arcade, you've got Apple News Plus, which includes, you know, newspapers as well as magazines and all of that kind of stuff. You've got iCloud storage. And ultimately what they're, I believe, rumored to be doing in the future is putting together a bundled subscription offering, which offers different tiers um, of essentially groupings of these various subscriptions. So essentially on the first tier, you would just have Apple Music and Apple TV. On the second tier, they would add in arcade third tier you get news plus fourth tier you get iCloud storage you get the idea but ultimately with each of these tiers I'm guessing it's going to be a lot a lot more appetizing in terms of the price um, as these subscription services go up what's your take on this Chad, it feels like we're one step away from having to get the Apple logo tattooed on our faces <laughs> and then like become part of the Apple ecosystem <laughs> ourselves, right? And have that walking around. Um, it really is, it makes all the sense in the world, yeah. like, like you say. But again, it's that, it's that closed ecosystem. It's like holding you yeah. in, like making sure that you buy every single product that they have. And it certainly is the year of subscriptions. It yeah. certainly seems like that is the way people are moving forward. And so it makes a lot of sense. Um, and of course, if the economics are there, it, it's gonna it's gonna win a lot of customers, Chad. But again, yeah. it, it just controls that market even more. Apple are just geniuses, <laughs> and uh, uh, pardon the pun, but they're really they're really really a company that understands how to build those walls around their ecosystem, and keep those fanboys, of which we are two of them, <laughs> let's be honest, um, keep those fanboys inside those walls. Chad. Yeah, definitely, it, it makes all the sense in the world, and especially like you, Barry, you've you kind of confined to Apple Music because you've got the Apple Watch. 
um, you know, it would definitely yep. make sense for you to maybe get that Apple News Plus subscription as well. Instead of the various magazines or, you know, like you say, paid news sources that, that you might have, you'll be able to get it all together in what I'm guessing is going to be a competitive kind of bundle. So the rumors are basically saying that this is going to potentially be rolled out alongside the iPhone 12. I know a lot of people are looking to that release if that happens. Obviously, supply chains were a concern initially, but I would imagine at this stage, we're kind of back to a normal-ish way of being uh, for that to be a concern. Do you think we're going to see an iPhone 12 this year, Barry? I don't know, Chad. I don't know. Of course, we, we, Apple likes to be on schedule with their releases. They're one of the few companies that does, like, on by clockwork, they do release their stuff. But it's been a very weird year. And like you say, the, the <laughs> exactly. It's been a weird year. And like, like those supply chain concerns, I'm sure they are, are worried about being able to fulfill that. Yeah. We all know when Apple releases a new iPhone, the sales numbers are, like, crazy, especially in the first few months. And so you got to be confident that you can fulfill however million orders sure. you can have. You don't want to have people waiting two to three months for their phone to arrive because that's not good for their brand. And so I'm sure that they'll be doing lots of an analytics behind the scenes, making sure that they understand exactly what their capacity is, what then what their forecast of demand is going to be, and then making a call based on yep. that. Um, and I'm hoping we'll hear pretty soon, Chad. I, I think the sales cycle, maybe, maybe I'm wrong, but is the sales cycle coming up pretty soon? Yeah, I'm so wrong. you're completely, you're, I mean, you are the Apple fanboy that you claim to be. So uh, <laughs> well done, Barry. We, we've got to give it to yes, you. Yes, come we've on. We've got to give it to you for that. Um, I mean, as far as I know, the, the you know the, the sales releases normally happen around kind of August, September when we're talking about the iPhone model. Um, obviously, in South mm. Africa, you wait a little while before it actually arrives. That don't side. rub it in. <laughs> don't rub it in. <laughs> um, but yes, yes. Uh, hopefully, we'll see it come out soon. I mean, they they rolled out the iPad Pro. Um, kind of at the heat of lockdown and they managed to get all of those out. Obviously, the demand is not the same levels as the iPhones, but obviously, we, you know, they've released all of the various new operating systems, so they've wet our appetite on that side. Um, I am just, you know, frothing to get into the new operating system. I know there are those public beaters, but they, they're quite risky to roll out on your main device. Yeah, I definitely, I'd, I've heard some horror stories about people putting betas on their phones and just yeah. removing everything, right? So you got to be very cautious with that unless you're, but, but Chad, the thing is you're a tech YouTuber now. <laughs> so you, you kind of are obliged to do this kind of stuff and let us know how it all works out. <laughs> so I'm going to hold you to that. But the question I really want to ask, Chad, is that are you going to go out and buy one of these new ones? I'm not. To be completely honest, I'm not. I've got the iPhone XS Max, which is now, I think it's I'm coming I'm so proud on, of you. <laughs> I'm so proud of I you. I think it's coming on two years, actually. <laughs> Um, but it's Barry. It's perfect for my needs. It is still as snappy and fast as it was right at the beginning. It's got the OLED screen, which you know I wouldn't want anything else of. It's it, it's a, the great size screen. It's got 256 gigs of storage. I just don't see any real need to upgrade to the new model. Obviously, there may be a feature or two um, that makes that changes that. You say it's fast and snappy now, Chair, but you know the moment they announce that iPhone 12, it's going to start to slow down and yes. slow down and slow down. You do. So it's going to be a, a test of your patience, I think. Uh, we all know Chad loves his gadgets, mm -hmm. and so I'm looking forward to seeing how long he can hold out because Apple are known for that kind of planned obsolescence. Yep. Um, but I'm in the same boat as you. I've got an iPhone 10, it still works perfectly. Cool. I have no intention of buying the yeah. new one um, because there aren't no real wholesale changes, yeah. like you say. Of course, the chips have been a big conversation, but the chips are so good these days that, I mean, I, I wouldn't even notice an Im improvement, right? Because all that I do is not that <laughs> memory intensive. Yeah. And so it's one of those things where I'm excited to see it because Apple, are always it's always a cool opportunity to see what they release and they're kind of on the forefront of a lot of stuff. Definitely. Um, but I don't think I'm going to be queuing or paying the crazy <laughs> amounts of rands that is necessary to buy a brand new iPhone. Yeah, with you there, Barry. Um, it, it is it is definitely crazy. But then when you do look at, I guess, the, the useful lives of these things and how they actually do last, they stand the test of time. And when the time comes to get another one, there is still resale value there. Um, but yeah, I'm just pitching the benefits of the Apple system. I'm just a normal fan, go, fan girl, uh, you know, going about <laughs> his or her uh, general dealing. So just don't mind me. I'm, I'm just sitting here on the side. Uh, Barry, I want to pull you back a little bit to our subscription bit of discussion. And just to kind of yes. bring this discussion full circle, because a little while back we spoke about a productivity app called Rome. And I saw you last week, <laughs> was the week before, on Twitter basically saying that you're you're 95 percent of the way there you might do it what has been the verdict so chad here's my dilemma right 
I, <laughs> it's, it's killing me. I don't know what to do. You, 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 you can help maybe. You can give me your opinion here. So I love the app. Right. I think you know that. I, I really love the app and I, I really would love to use it. What, what, I, what they have is they've got what's called a Rome Scholars Program, oh. right? Which is basically for people who can't afford the full price. So the full price is about $15 a mm-hmm. month which in South African rands is quite quite hefty for this kind of app, <laughs> right? Yeah, it's, it's, it's a lot of money. So it's not, the, it's not the kind of thing that you just put in your credit card and forget about. Like yeah. you'll feel it every time a ticket, the debit order goes off. But what this Rome Scholars Program is supposed to be is like a sponsorship program for people who can't afford it, basically. Okay. So I, I applied for this thing. I went on and had like a, a little uh, survey and you fill in all your details. You answer why you need it, why you want it, what your situation is. And so I gave the whole sob story. <laughs> I'm a little guy from Africa here. I'm <laughs> not fully employed at the moment. Yeah. I, I would love to use it for my research, yada, yada, yada. And I didn't hear from them for like two or three weeks. So okay. I'm like, okay, cool. I didn't get it. I got an email a couple of days ago, no three or four days ago, saying I've been accepted. What? Very. And so what that means, what that means, I don't think it's like an achievement or anything. I just think they just took so long to get back because <laughs> they had so many people <laughs> applying. Um, I don't think it says anything about me. But anyway, what happens is this Rome Scholars Program gives you them gives you the, the, the subscription at 50% off. Right. So the cost now is $7.50 okay. a month, which is in that uncanny valley between, it's like, I could now afford it, yes, but it's not, it's not, yeah. it's like, it's still not super, super cheap. Yeah. Um, and so it's one of those things where I don't know where I stand right now. It's, I think, I, I really think if I get a, if I get a, like a proper use out of it, then it would be worth it. But I'm scared to pay the money and then after three or four days, the novelty is worn off and I go back to something else. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, no, I understand that completely. And that point that you're at at the moment is that point where something that was originally overpriced, let's just admit it, was originally overpriced, now it turns down yeah. to maybe what would have been the normal price, but is still still expensive for a productivity app. Let's just take it back to basics. It's a productivity app. Um, you know, ultimately you can get, you know, Lightroom or I don't know one of those Adobe apps for that kind of price, um, which will do a whole lot more in terms of uh, you know capability. But obviously, in terms of information and data, Rome is the way to go. Um, so it's interesting. I sorry for doing the little celebration and I did a little dance in my head when you got accepted because I thought it was some kind of prestigious uh, you know thing, uh, but ultimately they they still sting you. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll take it, Chad. I'll take it. But it's, it's one of those things where yeah. I think they've been overwhelmed by this. And I think that they are looking to, I, I saw an article on their blog, they are looking to, okay. to create location-specific mm-hmm. pricing. Because I think a lot of these apps, obviously they start in the States and so they sure. price it for a, for a US market. And then when you do the conversion into your currency, yeah. it just doesn't make sense over here in South Africa, uh, for example. So I know that a lot of these companies, a lot of these SaaS products, I know my Evernote is priced in rands right. here in South Africa. And it's not okay. equivalent to what the subscription is in the US because it's tied to living costs and it's tied to that sort of thing so i'm hoping as they start to like expand their business properly that they'll start to get location-based yep. pricing and that that might even come down even more but i've got to make a decision now whether the seven seven dollar fifty is worth it to me or not and i just don't know where i stand <laughs> on that so i'm going to let it ruminate for a few more days i'm going to see what happens um, and i will report back if i decide to take the plunge and give it a go sounds interesting well thanks for at least uh, giving us an update barry um, but that is quite a dilemma indeed Let's then move on to our next segment. Develop and grow. Develop and grow, the section where we try and become better people, Chad. We try and improve our habits. We try and get fitter and healthier and stronger and smarter and all those good things. And uh, today's one, today's piece for the segment comes from a podcast I listened to a couple of days ago from one of my favorite thinkers, a guy by the name of Carl Newport. And we've chatted about him in the past. He's written some very influential books, certainly to my thinking. And he had this quote that really stood out for me, Chad. And it's one of those quotes, I don't know if you've ever had this, where it feels like the author's talking directly to you and calling you (laughs) out on your own nonsense. It felt like one of those moments. And the quote goes like this, discipline is consistently doing the things that make you better not the things that make you feel better. And he kind of expanded on that as he started to talk about it. And the reason, it's, the, the best way to describe it is to talk through an example of my own life, which is why it spoke to me so much. One of the examples he gave was that, imagine you're trying to become a great writer, right? So you're really passionate about writing. You really want to write books and, and articles and whatnot and really become known as a writer. I'm one of those people. That's one of my goals in life, right? And I think anyone who knows me yeah. knows that. 
And uh, if you want to become a great writer, there's certain things that, that you have to do in order to become great. And everyone knows it. It's right consistently. So every single day, you have to be getting words on paper. You have to be doing editing. You can't just post your first drafts. You've got to be working on things time and time again. You've got to do proper research. You've got to understand language and vocab and all of these good things. And there's, there's a lot of those actions that, that make you better. And they're difficult and they have to be done. Then there's a whole other set of actions, which is kind of... They're related to writing. They do They do feel better. It makes you feel good about yourself, but they don't actually contribute to making you a better writer. I don't know if that yeah. makes any sense, but examples of that might be watching an on, watching a course online about writing, but like passively. So just sitting there and watching it as inspiration, yeah. right? Or reading a book about writing instead of doing the writing, <laughs> for example. So pro procrastinating on the real thing by pretending to do the real thing. Or, or the one that stuck out, stood out for me, Chad, was writing things for your own personal blog, but never actually testing it in actual media publications. Yep. So that's the one that stood out for me is that if I want to become a great writer, I need to be sending my stuff to, to media outlets and getting it published and, and seeing if real editors who work in the field think it's good enough to be shown to other people. And that's that's kind of my been my thought process last week is that how much of the stuff that we do is just playing at the game, playing at the dream, kind of pretending we want to get that dream, but not actually taking the risk to put yourself out there and say, okay, if I want to become great at this thing, I have to share yeah. it with the world. I have to get it out in front of people that aren't my friends and family and really test myself in, in, in the arena, per se, rather than just being very safe and doing it within your own little wall and telling yourself, oh, I'm, I'm getting good at writing without actually getting the real criticisms or the real feedback. What do you think about that? Yeah, I think it's important. I just wanted to ask you, Barry, when you read that sentence, how many times did you read it over? Because whenever that happens to me where I feel like the author is talking to me directly, I can <laughs> I can read it 10 times over. Yeah, it was one of those things. It was burned in my brain immediately, Chad. Yeah. I, on, on, on my email newsletter I sent out this morning as of time of recording, it was the, the original piece and I couldn't get it out of my brain. It's like the, this, this. it really stood out for me and it, it spoke exactly to what I've been doing over the last few months. Yeah. And so it almost felt like a personal attack. I was like, ugh, like a knot <laughs> in my stomach, you know. <laughs> well, it's understandable. It's understandable. But I, I think that I think that's a great quote. And to be honest, I think I need to read a lot more of, of Carl Newport because you've really – brought quite a few uh, gems and you've, you've, you've held them in really high light, um, you know, certainly. But just in terms of this one, I think you're right. I don't think I need to add a whole lot more to it, but I've seen that in in, in myself as well. Um, certainly in terms of creating films and doing that kind of stuff. Like you say, you'll watch all sorts of things and you'll try to, you try to inspire yourself. You try to feel better, but ultimately that brings you nowhere closer in terms of getting to the final product. And so I think you're right. I think we ultimately need to go and do the hard work we need to to, you know, th look at things from first principles. Uh, we need to be inspired, yes, uh, but not not be fooling ourselves. Ultimately, you know, do the things that actually tracked over time will actually make us better. And a great example that's popped in my mind right now, Barry, is me and my, I don't know, music interest. So something that makes me feel better is learning a song note for note from a YouTube video and straight away picking out my camera playing it, recording it, singing it. And basically it comes across well, right? It comes across on the other side. You look at this guy playing this song. He, he's singing really well. He's, he's play, he knows how to play the piano. Surely he knows quite a few, you know, bits of musical theory or knows how to, you know, string together other songs. And ultimately, no, I know that one very song. So rather than doing the thing that would actually make me better, which is going in front of the piano every single day or for an hour a day on a consistent basis, learning from the very basic things, um, you know, looking at things that are not necessarily going to sound good when you do them, um, but things that will make you better when you actually can actually tie things together. Um, that's an example that just struck a chord with me. Yeah, it's a great example. But I think I want to make it clear, though, that it's only if that's your goal, right? So, so for example, like if, if it's just a hobby of yours, you enjoy doing it, then please like do exactly what you're saying. And yeah. what I'm talking about here is when you when you really want to become a master and an expert at this. And so yeah. if that is the goal, then for sure, then the consistent practice, the deliberate practice, the, the real hard work needs to be done behind the scenes. And I, the way I see it is it's almost putting tough love on yourself. Yeah. So saying to yourself, listen, 
I know that it feels good right now, and I know that it's very safe to kind of share your stuff with the people that you know will be happy for you no matter what you show them. Um, but the reality is that if you want to get better, you have to get out of your comfort zone and, and think a little bit bigger. And, uh, and that's one of those things like there's a difference between someone who spends three months researching the perfect workout plan and watches all these YouTube videos, <laughs> what, reads all these programs and plots out yep. the 30 days and what I'm going to do each day. It's a difference between that person and the person that is just in the gym every single day. Right. And it's yeah. just doing the actions without overanalyzing it, without reading a thousand different things. And uh, so I think I've fallen into that trap a lot in my life where I read well. and read and read and read about things instead of just doing them and learning as I go. And so it's a little bit of tough love on yourself to say, hold on a minute. If I truly want to get better at this, if I truly want to master this task, action beats feeling. Yep. It's not about how many videos you watch. It's not about how many tutorials Although they have value, I'm not I'm not degrading sure. them. Sure. But do not spend three weeks watching YouTube tutorials. Rather, just do the thing and put it out mm. there and learn from that experience because that is how you get better at things. Yep. And I think it's fear that holds us back. It's fear of what if it's not good? Like what if that song I put out isn't good? Or what if that writing piece isn't good? Or what if I go to the gym and I don't know how to use the equipment, etc.? <laughs> that kind of fear gets in the way and, and it stops us from just taking action. But if you're able to, if you acknowledge the fact that that action is what creates change, it's not motivation, it's not not like fancy quotes, it's not fancy structures, it's action every single day on something that's important to you. That's what you have to focus on. Yeah, agreed. Uh, and Barry, I mean, if your goal for any particular hobby, and I know things can be hobby, but if your goal is not mastery, is your goal not set high enough? Like, do you actually pick up a task and say? Well, this is where I want to settle. I'll be happy to be here for the rest of my life at this particular level. I don't know. I just feel like you should always strive for ultimate mastery. And if you can't get there, the next the next best is where you, you know, where the other person sets their boundaries. Or am, am I being a bit too hard, Barry? I agree with you, Chad, but that's because I'm an A-type personality <laughs> just like you, right? So I'm very aware there's a lot of people out there who yeah. are not as ambitious and driven as we are. Right. And so I, I, I don't want to I don't want to make the case that everyone should be chasing this like top 1% in, sure. in some task, even though we are going to because that's who we are, right? I'm exactly the same as you. When I, when I see Jacob Collier play music, <laughs> I want to be him. I want to be as right. good as him. And yeah. I've got no reason to think that because I'm yeah. never going to get there. I know that. Yeah. But that that's what comes in my mind immediately. But for a lot of people, that's not the case. I know a lot of people who are more than happy to just learn those famous four chords and be able to pull yep. out an acoustic guitar and play silly pop songs, right? And, and yep. that's absolutely fine if that's your goal. Like, do not take our advice if that's the case. If that's the case, then just do what makes you happy. Yep. That's yep. great. Definitely. Do whatever feels good. For sure. I'm talking to the people who really have ambition and really want to become world class at a certain skill or a certain set of skills. And for those people... Don't kid yourself. And I'm talking to me as well here. <laughs> Don't delude yourself, right? Tell yourself the truth about what is needed, what sacrifice is needed to get to the top in these fields and then do it. Yeah, yeah, you're completely right, Barry. And I don't want to come across harsh either. I'm also <laughs> never going to get to the top level of every little hobby that I take on. But certainly in the back of my mind uh, is the will to get there one day. Um, and, you know, that to me is important, the, the will to progress. But you're completely right. Maybe, maybe that's not for everyone. And that's okay. Um, you know, everyone has their thing in this world. It's all about self-awareness. Yep. It always comes back to self-awareness. How well do you know yourself? Do you know your strengths and weaknesses? Do you know what you want to get out of this life? And if you know that, then don't listen to people who talk about other stuff. Yep. Like focus on what you want out of life and do your best to chase those goals. Um, it's it, That's what it all comes down to. So advice is always easy to give and it's easy to receive sometimes. Make sure it's from someone who has similar goals and similar passions to you. Otherwise, it doesn't make sense to listen to it. You must focus on what is good for you as an individual, no matter what that is. Completely agree, Barry. And what an amazing note to end yet another fantastic episode on. We are 41 episodes in now. Um, we're becoming veterans at this thing. And uh, yeah, I mean, ultimately, again, ending pretty much, I'd say, online on the on the one hour mark, which is uh, pretty good going. We, we're getting there. And uh, for the very first time, Barry, we're going to be next week talking across different ponds. 
I'm going to be on the middle of some remote island. Hopefully, if I have internet connection. If not, guys, I'm sorry. You're going to get Barry solo <laughs> next week by himself. Um, but yeah, looking forward to that. I'm really looking forward to Chad because I kind of assumed in 2020 we'd have more of those things. So I was going to be traveling. You yeah. were going to be traveling. Yeah. And so I was hoping we would have more of the stuff. But unfortunately, of course, we've had a very strange 2020. Mm. So I'm very excited for that very first episode, which might be a different pond we're <laughs> going to go across. But I really think we're hitting our stride. I'm really enjoying these conversations. Of course, like from where we started to where we are yep. now, Chad, 41 episodes later, there's been a lot of change, a lot of improvements. I look back on some of the old ones. I'm like, oh, it's a bit cringy. <laughs> but that's all part of the process. And we're very grateful that you've joined us on this journey. If you've listened this far, you're a legend as always. And uh, we hope we will see you next week where perhaps we're going to be across a different pond. <laughs> Absolutely. And until next week, please do follow us on Instagram. We are at Across the Pondcast. I'm only going to give you that handle this time because I think you should definitely go and check out <laughs> what we've got on Instagram. <laughs> Um, which is such a great platform for this. Thanks again for tuning in and we'll see you next week. Pond, pond across the pond.